The party that changed my life. Josh, hey man, thanks for staying to help clean up last night. Hope you had a good time. Me, your party was a blast. How'd it go with Casey? Josh, no go bro. She had to take her wasted friend home. I slid the phone back in my pocket. I was only asking to be polite. I couldn't care less about Josh or his parties. I wouldn't have gone at all if Kimberly, a girl from my physics class, hadn't mentioned she was going too. She only knew my serious, studious side, but there's nothing like a party to show how suave and charming I could be, right? Just my luck that she didn't show and I had to endure an evening of beer like piss, screaming idiots, and that damn music which I know is going to haunt me all day. That and this pounding hangover. Josh, my poor turtle had to put its head back in the shell. You know what I mean. Why is he still texting me? How do I even reply to that? I hope he doesn't think we're friends now. I didn't even know his frat house was hosting the stupid party. Maybe if I don't reply he'll just. Josh, the flight was ready for landing, but the runway was blocked by a fat cow. The dive was scheduled, but there were a bunch of needy sharks in the water. It was time for my pizza, but the meatloaf wasn't having any fun so I guess that means all the food had to get sent back. Me, that makes absolutely no sense, but I get it. Now will he get it? Of course not. If he got it, he wouldn't still be texting me. Josh, by the way bro. Do you know who Kimberly is? Me, yeah. Was she there last night? No. Josh couldn't have. Please God, don't let that disgusting frat boy anywhere near. Josh, some dipshit wrote Kimberly is dead. Stop wasting time on her with a marker on my wall. Good thing for renter's insurance, lol. The chair in front of me was empty in physics today. The long golden braid which usually fell about my desk was gone. I hadn't realized how long this class was when I had to stare at the whiteboard instead. To make matters worse, the stream of texts from Josh didn't stop. Josh, dude I found another message. This one was written in my bathroom, her head took the longest to remove. The vertebra kept snapping, and her neck must have stretched four feet before it finally popped free. WTF Josh, here's one written on my closet, her breasts looked much bigger when they were still attached. Such a fake girl, no one will miss her. Josh, there's another on the side of my fridge. I'm saving some for later. I excused myself to leave. I still had biology after this, but I felt like I was going to be sick. This had to be a twisted prank. Maybe he thought I wanted to join his frat or something, and this is what they did to haze people. But then why wasn't Kimberly in class? I couldn't let this get to my head. All I had to do was check her Facebook, right? Okay, no updates since the day before last. But I could send her a message. Hello Kimberly. We've never really talked, but I just wanted to make sure you haven't been butchered. Hope we can go out sometime. Yeah that isn't the suave first impression I was hoping to make. Think. Think. I was freaking out. Of course I didn't have to mention the butchery. If she replied at all, then she was okay, right? Do you think you're nervous texting a girl for the first time? Try it when all you can think about is her dismembered corpse scattered across some frat house. Me, hey Kimberly. Did you go to Josh's party last night? Deleted. I couldn't send that, because then I'd just be admitting to eavesdropping on her plans. How about? Me, hey Kimberly. Saw you missed physics today so I wanted to remind you about the quiz on Friday. I closed my eyes and hit send. I hope that doesn't make me sound like all I cared about was physics. Maybe I should add a follow-up to ask. BZZZ. A reply. She's okay. I mean of course she's okay, but she replied. And so quickly too. 
You don't reply that fast unless you really want to talk to someone. Josh, dude look what's in my fridge. Attached was a photo of a dismembered foot sitting on the shelf beside the cheese. He sent me a couple more texts, but I didn't read them. I was running toward his place. Either something horrible has happened and I had to see for myself, or he was trolling me and was about to receive a beating of a lifetime. By the time I got over, I still hadn't received a reply from Kimberly. That could mean anything though. If she wasn't in class it was because she was busy with something, so of course she couldn't reply. So why did I feel like I was going to die? This place looked even worse in the daylight. The building had been trashed and stitched together so many times it might as well have been the Frankenstein's monster of frat houses. I pounded on the door so hard that my hand went numb. Josh! Get your ass out here! The door opened and I almost hit him in the face. Then he started laughing, and I really did hit him. Right between the eyes. My fist stung like hell, but it felt so good I would have done it a hundred more times. It had all been a prank. Kimberly was okay. Shit dude, cool it. Can't you take a joke? Who does that? How badly do you need attention that you would screw with me like that? Never talk to me again. I've seen enough. I turned around and stomped my way across the yard. Come on man, it's not like that. I just found the photo online somewhere, but the messages were real. You're messed up, man. Leave me alone, I said. Look. There's another one on the fence, he shouted after me. So what? You probably wrote it, you twisted shit. I swear dude. I didn't write any of it. The picture is the only thing that wasn't real. I didn't want to look, but I couldn't help myself. I glanced at the fence. Written in black marker, it said, she was my third. What is even worse than listening to him? Believing him. Because looking at those big blocky letters, I know Josh couldn't have written that. I know because it was unmistakably my handwriting. Next story. The solution to prison overcrowding. There is no devil, only man, and he does not buy souls. Not all at once anyway. Man is far more insidious than that, for he grinds down his brother's soul one layer at a time until the residual humanity begins to devour itself. It's hard to believe, but it's true. Begin to break a man, and he will finish the job on his own. That is because it is much easier to live as an animal than it is as half a man. I felt the first part of my humanity die when I was twelve years old. How do you explain a knotted garbage bag full drowned kittens to a child? I was young, but not too young to know that someone had done it on purpose, and that they had gotten away with it. Not too young to understand that evil wasn't just a thing in cartoons and movies, not too young to realize that I too was capable of evil if I ever got my hands on this monster. Over the years, I felt more of myself slip away. Sometimes it would break off in big chunks like when my mother died, but more often my soul simply eroded from the steady tide of petty grievances, jealous greed, thoughtless anger, and the thousand other frustrations that make up the life of any civilized man trying to find his place in the world. My defense attorney wanted me to talk about how I regretted killing Edward. That it was a defining moment in my life, and that my mind had been blown wide with righteous rebirth and revelation. There wasn't enough left of me to lie though. I don't think my pulse even rose the night I took my neighbor's life. Edward used to beat his wife, and now he doesn't. That's all that changed, because there wasn't enough left of me to change. It almost makes me laugh now to think how far I still was from rock bottom. I got fifteen years for that. Could have been worse but the judge and jury were sympathetic after hearing the widow tearfully thank me for saving her. I can't even say I found jail any worse than the outside either. The only difference was my daily routine, and the blur of a different set of faces performing it with me. I gained a reputation as a loose cannon in jail. 
People said I'd go from deadpan silence to an incoherent rage in one second flat. I don't think of it that way though. I think of myself more like a brilliant pianist, seeming ordinary until sitting down to play. The musical ability didn't suddenly appear out of nowhere, it had been inside all along. It was the same with my anger, it was always there, but it was my choice whether to let it play. I was five years into my sentence before one of the guards took my moods personally, landing me in the hole. It was only supposed to be for a week, but everything I did seemed to extend the time. Unresponsive to the officer. Add a week. Didn't eat the food. Add a week and get my next meal replaced with the loaf, rotten cabbage and bread. Didn't eat the loaf. Another week, and no other food until I choked it down. Even after I vomited it back up, they wouldn't give me more food until I'd eaten my sick just to teach me a lesson. I don't know what that lesson was, but the only thing I learned was to hate the whole. Having nothing to do is boring, but knowing it will continue without cessation is despair. I was never a social person, but I found myself so starved for human contact that I even tried hugging the guard. It was like I needed someone to touch me just to prove I was still real, but nothing relieved the relentless pressure of the second-by-second -second attack on the soul which was isolation. I knew I was really losing it when a fly found its way into my room. I named it Robazio and talked to it just to hear something besides the droning of fluorescent lights and the distant shouts from other cell blocks. I told Robazio about the girl I liked in high school, and how beautiful the sly wrinkle at the edge of her smile was. I described to him what a sunrise looked like, and the taste of chocolate cake, and about the drawings I used to sketch, and a thousand other things which I hadn't appreciated at the time. I didn't tell the fly that I never expected to see them again, I didn't want to make him sad and leave. It didn't matter though, because the next time I woke, he was gone anyway. I'm not ashamed that I cried to be alone again, in fact I was relieved. It meant there was still part of me which was human enough to feel. P.S.S.S.T. Hey buddy. I opened my eyes. I wasn't sleeping, I was just lying on my back, preferring my malleable imagination to the stagnant cell. The voice had come from behind me. Can you hear me? What's your name? The voice asked. Someone else must have heard me talking to the fly. I turned around and found a crack in the mortar behind my bed. It must have connected with another cell in the housing detention block. Does it matter? I asked. Of course it does. It's the most important thing in the world. It's the thing they can't take from you. My name's Riley. Hi Riley. I'm Travis, I replied. Have you been recruited yet, Travis? I don't know what you're talking about, I said. I glanced back at the closed door of my cell. Even if someone heard me, they'd probably just think I was talking to myself again. It's not like they checked on us very often. Okay good, Riley said. They're going to offer you a deal soon. You have to take it, trust me. What deal? Why would I trust you? I don't even know you. Sure you do buddy, he said. I'm your only friend in the world. I heard metal scrape on metal. My door opened. I threw the pillow over the crack in the mortar and sat rigidly upright. I was reluctant to leave my new friend, but I don't think the guard noticed. My muscles were stiff from the cramped quarters, but I didn't even run around much. All I could think about was how great it would be to have someone to talk to now. And the deal? It couldn't have been that special if he was still in prison, but it was something to think about. Something to look forward to. Maybe they'd even given him books or a notepad. A laptop or TV would be almost as good as getting out. Riley never answered again though. For two days I tapped on the wall, but all I heard was ceaseless muttering. An old man swearing under his breath kind of muttering, like he was trying to talk but couldn't decide whether he was talking to himself or someone else. All hours of the day and night, non-stop muttering. I don't even remember him pausing to eat, let alone draw breath. 
Most of it was inaudible gibberish, but there were a few things I finally made out after they were repeated for the thousandth time. Didn't expect to see him again. No sir, no. Just pretend to be human for me, will you? We can both pretend. I'm Riley. You're Riley too, but I was Riley first. I lost track of how long I was supposed to stay in here, but I'm sure I should have been out of solitary a long time ago. By the time they came to offer me the deal, I was completely convinced that accepting it was the only way to ever get out. It's very simple, we have nothing to hide, the prison warden told me. He looked like the type of man who would force his children to only speak when spoken to, and even then only if they addressed him as sir. We could easily force you to accept, the warden continued, after all, you are in my power. I choose when you sleep, when you eat, if you eat, but I am still making this a completely voluntary arrangement. What do you want from me? I asked. Prison overcrowding is a serious issue, the warden said. It felt like he was reading from a pre-prepared script. He was looking at me, but I wasn't really being seen. The prison system has grown 700% over the last generation. It's costing us up to 40 grand per inmate every year. 74 billion annually nationwide. The government is actively exploring alternative programs which can satisfy the need to deter and rehabilitate criminals without the prohibitive expense and opportunity cost of prison. I'm offering you the chance to volunteer in one of these programs. You're going to take me out of prison. Then how come Riley stayed in here? The warden's face screwed up like he'd just taken a bite from a lemon. Riley is gone. He's been gone for a while now. There was something about how he emphasized the name which made it seem like Riley hadn't changed locations. He'd changed from being Riley. The warden was already talking again though, and there wasn't any space to ask questions. I can't disclose all the details with you, but rest assured your sentence will be considerably abbreviated. Our programs are designed for maximal efficiency and 15 years of wasted time and money are going to be condensed into a weekend. I didn't care about the time. What did I have to look forward to on the outside? It might seem inconsequential to you, but the only reason I accepted his offer was that I missed having someone to talk to. And if this was a government project, then what was the worst they could do? Maybe I really could get a clean start. The warden gave me some papers to sign and then left. I was handcuffed by the guard and escorted out of my cell. He tried to keep my head low, but I caught a glimpse of the adjoining cell where Riley must have stayed. A man in a rubber suit was pressure washing blood out of the stone tiles. What happened to that guy? I asked the guard. Is he hurt? The guard shifted uneasily and looked around like he wasn't sure if he was supposed to say or not. Then he shrugged. What was he still doing in there? I pressed. I thought Riley made the same deal. Yeah he finished his deal, the guard said. He was supposed to be released in a few more days after the official pardon was granted, but I don't know. Guess he wanted a quicker way out. The man in a rubber suit picked up a fork on the floor. It was covered in congealed blood all the way up the handle. I tried to get a better look but the guard shoved me onward. I was put into the back of an unmarked police car. Somehow I'd expected a whole bus load of people, but it was only me. In a few days I'd be a free man. It hardly seemed possible. How was I supposed to pick up the pieces and become something new? Anyway it sounded like Riley really was going to be released, if he hadn't, well I wasn't as fragile as him. I could survive anything for a weekend. I wasn't paying much attention to where we were going, but we drove for a long while before the car stopped at a ranch deep in the desert. There weren't any pens for animals, just wide open spaces separated by low stone barriers which I could have easily stepped over. I guess they didn't worry much about escape when there was nowhere to escape to. Welcome to Camp Rawhide. I was greeted by a man wearing a leather vest and denim pants who stood outside the ranch house. The officer uncuffed my hands, but I didn't move. 
I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Ten years left on your sentence, all over in two days. Seems like a pretty good deal to me, eh? But don't you worry, you won't miss out on anything, the man continued. His voice was muffled from speaking around the cigar in his mouth. His eyes didn't leave my face, mine didn't leave his. It's my job to make sure you still get ten years worth of punishment this weekend. I heard the sound of tires roaring over dry earth. I hadn't even noticed the officer had gone, but it was too late now. I couldn't look away from the man in front of me. The man I killed. What are you doing here? Edward grinned. He took a step closer to me and took the cigar out of his mouth. Same thing as you, darling. I'm just trying to find some justice in this shit-stained world. But between you and me, I don't know if there really is any justice out there. I reckon there are just people who got what they deserved, and people who got lucky. Another step closer. I could feel the heat radiating from the end of his cigar as it brushed my hand. He was exactly the same as that insufferable creature I used to live next to. His words blew onto my face alongside his rancid breath. And by the time I'm through with you, there won't be any doubt. You weren't one of the lucky ones. Next story. A letter from the cold case files. I work at a police station, first in my precinct to be equipped with the latest video spectral comparator. The device is absolutely amazing for reconstructing obscured writing, and we've already used it to blow open three cases by deciphering evidence which had been almost completely obliterated. Incriminating letter. Receipt putting you at the crime scene. Well what looks to you like a harmless pile of ashes in the waste bin can now be all we need to close the case. The downside? I've had to take a huge-ass folder of paperwork home with me on the weekends since it's been installed. The inspector in charge wants us to skim every cold case in the entire precinct for areas where the new technology might be applicable. Boredom doesn't even begin to describe it, but I did come across an interesting letter which we've managed to repair from its severe water damage. I hope you'll enjoy it as much as I did. To my lovely wife, dear Eva. Never has the fear of the hunted been so evident as it was with you. I could not stand to see you this agitated, the slightest creak in our house causing such violent tribulations. You could barely drink a cup of tea without being drenched by your trembling hands. At night, I heard you moan with the bitterest lamentations, and nothing I said seemed to provide you with the least respite. I can't escape. I heard the things you muttered to yourself when you didn't think I was listening. He's going to find me and take me away. Not today, please not today, but soon. I can't escape. I think I even know who you were referring to. I caught him more than once, sitting in his car across the street. Watching our house through his tinted windows. That cold, professional man, the one with the eyes of a killer. I sought answers from him, but upon seeing my approach, he shuddered like he'd been possessed and drove off before I could utter a word. Eva, sweet Eva, nothing in this life could make you deserve such torment. The curtains never part to let the light in. Any more, and you must suffer terribly if you are so loath to reveal yourself that you prefer candles to electricity. How long has it been since you even left the house? And no, I don't count ordering food online then waiting until dark to sneak out and snatch it like a quivering mouse. I was afraid that even these precautions might not be enough to save you, until the night when I finally witnessed your resolve. You fixed your hair and makeup, although you are just as beautiful without, and dressed warmly against the midnight chill. I understand now why you didn't tell me where you were going, as intent as you were upon your grisly mission. I do not mind that you are self-absorbed, my dear. It only makes me more grateful for the attention I do receive. No matter. How hard you try to exclude me though, I will always be there to protect you. It is one thing to face your fear, but how could you think I would let you do it alone? The hour we drove together on the highway was the closest I have felt to you in a long time, and when you pulled off on the side to wait, it seemed as though we were the last two people on earth. 
I didn't notice the shovel in back until you got out of the car, finally satisfied that our pursuer lost the trail. That's when I was convinced that I mistook the greatest moment of your resistance for the epitome of your despair. You weren't here to fight your pursuer, or even run from him. You had come to dig your own grave. I swore to love you, but that is no obligation to a woman of your beauty. I swore to serve you, but how could I act as usher to your final rest? Please, I begged, tell me what would drive you to such an end. Do you remember how you flinched at my words? But the cold defiance in your eye made me somehow believe you had not given up yet. Were you afraid I would be angry at what you've done? Eva, blameless Eva. I could never be angry at you. That I would try to stop you, or get in your way. Never. I will only ever move to your desire, my love. And with the opening of the trunk, I finally understood you. I felt nothing but relief when we carried the body out together, burying it there in the desert far from the prying eyes of petty men who do not understand the burden of love. If that is what needed be done to make you happy again, then I would have had it no other way. I still do not know why the man hunted you, but it is not my place to force unpleasant memories and spoil your mind. I am writing this to let you know that nothing that happened will ever change how I feel about you. That I understand what you did, even admire you for going through with it. Eva, shining Eva, please do not let this be a barrier between us. Speak to me, welcome me as you once did, and I swear I will shelter you. I can forgive all evils in this world except the one that takes you away from me. Forever yours, Ivan. There you have it. As clean and incriminating an indictment as you'll ever find in writing. Of course I felt sorry for Eva after being stalked, but disregarding the due process of law and killing the man, well we couldn't exactly give her a free pass. I was so excited bringing this to the inspector in charge, and so disappointed when he disregarded it as irrelevant. Obvious fabrication, he told me. Eva hadn't been stalked. She'd been investigated by the police. She was a suspect because she stood to gain a considerable amount of wealth after her husband Ivan's disappearance, although the case was eventually dropped without finding his body or sufficient evidence. The fact that a letter so stained with tears as to be almost unreadable was reconstructed didn't prove anything, except maybe the confused mind of a grieving widow. I may have let my excitement rush me to conclusions, but seeing that the husband was the one who was murdered, the inspector must be right to think it was impossible for him to be the author. Besides, how could Ivan help her bury his own body? Next story. The Organic Machine. 3D printing is the future, and the future is here. We are on the verge of another industrial revolution, and I'm incredibly excited to be a part of it. I'm a photogrammetry software designer, and I've spent the last four years working with fashion and clothing companies. I even worked at Nike for a while, they're already beginning to 3D print shoes. I recently had the opportunity to apply my skills to a medical laboratory where they're beginning to 3D print human tissue. It's an ingenious concept, suspending living cells in a smart gel which allows the cells to fuse together into tissue once they're in alignment. The smart gel is then washed away, leaving an organ of purely human tissue. We're the first company to replicate organic vascular structures, Dr. Hansaf claimed on my first day there. He led me through the sterile halls which droned with dull fluorescent lighting. The organs we print can diffuse oxygen and nutrients even more efficiently than those in your body. Several other lab technicians passed me in the hall. I smiled, but each averted their gaze immediately, finding a sudden fascination with the blank floor tiles. It sounds like you know what you're doing. What do you need me for? I asked. Our scaffolding needs to be remodeled. One of our organs seems to be leaking, and we can't figure out why. Which one? He didn't need to answer though. As soon as Dr. Hansaf opened the door at the end of the hallway, I saw the most macabre sight I could have imagined. A steel table was lined with row upon row of human eyeballs, each staring at me from their great, unblinking orbs. Leaking might be an accurate term, 
but they would be better described as crying. The saline liquid filled each eye to overflowing before draining into a multitude of tiny pools upon the table. Quite beautiful, aren't they, he said, and I jumped a little to realize how close he was behind me. Almost perfect, almost better than perfect. This design can see three times sharper than a human with 20 twentieths vision. It can even see beyond the traditional visual electromagnetic spectrum, perceiving some of the near ultraviolet spectrum as well. Beautiful isn't the first word I would have chosen, but I could understand his pride. They looked real enough that you wouldn't look twice if a pair of these was staring back at you from a human face. The modeling software is on that computer, he gestured to a desktop workstation in the corner which was set up beside a second door. You'll find all the current designs on there. I'll give you some time to look everything over and see if you can't find the issue. I'll be back to check on you in an hour. I couldn't tear my gaze away from the eyes. I nodded stiffly again, hearing the door close behind me. I wasn't about to ditch a job just because of the unsettling environment. I averted my eyes from the table and walked over to the computer. While it was booting up, I cast another glance behind me. My heart skipped a beat. Each of the eyes had turned to watch me. They were facing the door a moment before, but now they were facing me. I slowly walked back to the door I came in, watching them this time. They turned to follow me. Without even realizing I was doing so, I put my hand on the door. Locked from the outside. There was a small glass viewing window in the door, but I couldn't see anything besides the hallway wall. Hello. Dr. Hanseth. I knocked on the door. No answer. I turned back, but the eyeballs were pointed toward the opposite door now. I took a deep breath. They weren't watching me, it was ridiculous to think they were. There must simply be some fast twitch muscles activating from the salt in the saline solution. I walked to the second door, locked as well. It was a high security laboratory though. It wasn't unreasonable to think the doors automatically lock. The doctor must have forgotten about it, but he was going to be back in an hour. I just had to focus on my job. I glanced back at the eyeballs, but they were still facing the door. I sat back down at the computer and loaded up the photogrammetry software. Pretty soon, I was so engrossed at inspecting the intricate scaffolding that I didn't even think about the eyes behind me. The secondary door opened beside me. Had an hour passed already? I turned, but I didn't see anyone in the room. Maybe he just peeked inside and saw I was still working. I turned back to the computer again. Footsteps. I spun around, but I still didn't see anyone there. I was about to go back to work when I noticed all the eyes were moving once more. Footsteps. Each one was slightly closer, slightly louder. The eyes were all following the empty space of ground where the sound was coming from. Something was there and I couldn't see it, but the artificial eyes could. Hello. I pushed the chair between myself and the footsteps and pressed my body against the desk. Is somebody there? The chair moved, and the footsteps got closer. I lurched backward into the wall and started moving around the room toward the door I entered from. Dr. Hansaf. I yelled. Let me out of here. I pounded on the door. Still locked. Footsteps. The eyes were all pointed directly next to me. Something is in here. Help. I screamed, slamming against the door with my shoulder. A face appeared in the viewing window. One of the lab technicians. He watched me for a moment, then began to write something down on a clipboard. What in the hell? I pounded on the door again and he looked up. I know you can see me. I yelled. Let me out of here. The lab technician tapped the side of his left eye. Then his right. He pointed at me. What was he trying to say? I glanced over my shoulder, the eyes were all watching the ground directly behind me. Tentatively, 
I reached out my hand and felt something cold and slimy in the air. It was just a couple inches from my face. Something like a hand loosely grabbed me back, but I quickly drew away. It didn't touch me again after that. What are you? I asked the empty air. Footsteps. The eyes followed them back to the corner of the room. What in the hell was going on? I turned back to the door. The lab technician was holding a piece of paper up against the glass. Would you like to be the first person to see it? I glanced back at the corner of the room. I nodded. The lab technician wrote something and held it up again. We will need to replace your eyes. Is that okay? I shook my head. He started writing again. He's not the only one. They're everywhere. We're not safe. I heard the second door open. I turned to see the eyes follow the thing out of the room. The door closed again. The primary door opened at once, and Dr. Hansaf entered. He was smiling like we had just shared a private joke. Well? What do you think? What the fuck was that? I asked. We don't entirely know, he admitted. It's something which is only visible in the near-ultraviolet spectrum, but machines aren't able to detect it. We only started noticing them once we printed the eyes. So you lied to me. You brought me here as a guinea pig. He shrugged and put his arm around my shoulder. I pushed him off. This is a laboratory, you shouldn't be surprised to find experiments being done here. But you came voluntarily, you will leave voluntarily, and you will only continue participating if you choose. Will you take the eyes? Absolutely not. I want no part in this. I was already heading marching down the hallway. I wish I had taken them though, because I heard footsteps following me all the way home. Next story. Painting the roses red. My neighbor Dr. Gregovich suffered both of life's greatest calamities. The first was falling in love, a rebellious and generally discouraged affliction to which he accidentally exposed himself when he was just five years old. Elaine, age four at the time, had given him a snow-white rose, doubtlessly obtained unlawfully, and if Gregovich's account is to be trusted, then he was helplessly within her power ever since. The fact that his first instinct was to eat the rose apparently did nothing to lessen the potency of this gesture. Fortunately for Gregovich, he thrived despite his adverse condition. By some miraculous trick which he swore he never anticipated, Elaine even came to love him back. It didn't happen all at once, but rather as a cumulative study told by the years of his devotion. He told me that he used to carry her school bag between classes, often finding himself on the wrong end of a rod after he absentmindedly stayed to watch her rather than attending his own schedule. He had stolen his first kiss in second grade by convincing her that she was a flower while he was a visiting bee, and by their junior year in high school, they were already engaged. It's hard to imagine promising your life to someone when you still haven't the faintest concept of what life entails, but perhaps things were simpler in 1941 when they were married. The world must have been jealous of their love, but two wars, seven children, and seventy-five shared years of illness, grief, and weariness which infiltrate even the happiest life proved insufficient to destroy their bliss. It was last month of this year when Elaine finally slipped beyond the capacity of his care and into that great freedom where care is no longer required. I saw the old man tremble so violently as he wept that I anticipated a second grave before the first was excavated, but it is the second of life's great calamities which forced his body to linger even after his soul had perished. At 94 years old, Dr. Gregovich left his house for the first time in almost 20 years to follow her last black procession. Since then however, I have seen him outside every day, kneeling upon the ground and mumbling through dried lips which have almost already returned to dust. Rain or storm or howling wind, I would see him there without fail when I returned from work. It was obvious what he was doing, but I asked anyway because it had been too long since my heart felt the warmth I knew his reply would bring. I'm planting roses, he told me. 
one for every year I borrowed her for. I'm sure you are making her very happy somewhere, I told him. I don't want her to be happy somewhere, I want her to be happy here. I want the smell to lead her back home to me. The roses flourished like nothing I had ever witnessed. Seeds the size of a corn kernel would begin sprouting the next day, and a week of growth conjured up a wild thorny expanse which I couldn't have traversed with a ladder. And the roses. Magnificent white blossoms, pure as starlight, beamed through my bedroom window each night as though the whole tapestry of the heavens had fallen to settle in his garden. I've never seen a flower grow like that, I told him. What's your secret? I'm not planting flowers, Dr. Gregovich replied. I'm planting memories. The older the memory is, the deeper the roots and the more precious the bloom. The next night I was woken by a terrible scream which my weary mind struggled to comprehend existing outside of a nightmare. I rushed to the window and saw Gregovich kneeling once more in his garden. The moon cast a net of light which caught the blood covering his body, and I rushed at once to his aid. What was he thinking gardening in the middle of the night? He must have cut himself with the shears, and I more than half expected to discover one of his frail hands, skin thin as rice paper, clipped straight from the stump. Down the stairs, out the door, breath coarse in my lungs, I stopped suddenly short. Gregovich sat calmly washing his hands with the gardening hose. Beside him lay a dead goat with a savage wound across its neck. No, there were three of the animals here. The first two were already hung up by their feet with buckets placed below them to collect the draining blood. The sticky sweet air from the flowers was tainted with the pungence of death, and I could see that two rows of his flowers were already dripping with their bloody varnish. Are you out of your mind? What on earth are you doing? It occurred to me, he said, now washing congealed blood from his paint brushes, that white roses are a lie. I can't entice Elaine to return by pretending all our memories are pure. I must show her the truth, the pain, the brutality, and the suffering of life, but remind her too that such sacrifice is still part of what makes it so beautiful. I was so bewildered by his explanation that I couldn't find anything to reply. I even helped him string his third animal above the buckets before going back inside to take a shower. He promised me that he didn't need to slaughter any more goats to finish his garden, and that he would later prepare the meat in a stew so that nothing was wasted. It was certainly the most peculiar way of dealing with grief I had ever encountered, but besides the initial shock, I didn't see anything especially more abhorrent about the situation than if the animals were killed by a butcher. Perhaps I was only making excuses to get back to bed though, because the next morning I was appalled by the sight outside my window. While the mask of night had subdued the color into subtle hues, the sun revealed the devastation of his sloppy work. Blood pooled upon the ground where it dripped from the flowers, leaving them unevenly streaked and stained like a field of open wounds. Bloody footprints invisible in the night crossed to and fro across his yard, and the swarming buzz of flies and stench of death made me feel as though I'd woken inside a battlefield. I crossed his yard delicately to confront him, careful not to tread in any of the tributaries of blood which snaked through the irrigation to coalesce into a small river which flowed into a nearby ditch. As I passed through the garden, I noticed a staggering array of signs which punctured the sticky red soil around each plant. Goat. Rat. Chicken. Cow. Dog. I was covering my nose with my t-shirt when I pounded on his door. The flowers beside the house were stained much darker than the others, and the dry soil told me he had been doing this for far longer than I knew. We both lived on the outskirts of a small town where no visitors were likely to trespass without warning, and if it wasn't for my intervention, he might have cut his way through an entire farm. Do you like it? I nearly added to the menagerie by jumping straight out of my own skin. He was standing behind me, grisly shears in hand, still soaked from his perversion. There weren't any footprints upon his doorstep, so he must have been attending to his macabre work all night long. It's the most vile thing I've ever seen, I told him honestly. And I'm sure Elaine would think the same and turn straight around even if she was coming back. 
This has to end. Do you see her? Elaine. Where are you? The poor creature's eyes bulged from their sockets with unrealized expectation. She's not here you dithering old bat. Then how can you say this is the end, he asked, swaying dangerously upon his feet as he pivoted to face me again. The slick shears gleamed evilly in his hand, and though I discounted him for his age, the magnitude of destruction around me proved some fire still burned within him. For both of our safety, I resolved to notify the police instead of handling the situation myself. I turned and marched swiftly away from Gregovich. I held my breath for as long as I could, but released it with an involuntary gasp before I had cleared the garden. A single white flower remained unsoiled at the edge of his garden. Planted in the soil beside it was a sign. Human. It was still white, but I had to act fast. If I called the police now. But I was already too late. I heard a loud pop like a firework going off, and then something sharp stung the back of my neck. At first I thought it was one of the biting flies drawn by the blood, but then I heard the sound again and a second needle pierced my thigh. Tranquilizer darts. I plucked them out and hurled them down, although the ground already seemed much closer than I remembered. My throat closed down to a pinhole and the field of red roses swam across my vision. The flowers danced like living things in a sordid parody of the animals which painted them red. But he was so old. If I could just crawl into the road, I could get away and someone would find me. I plunged my hands into the bloody soil and dragged myself into the ditch. The thick liquid from the fields flooded over me, offering at least some concealment. I choked on air as thick as the river which flooded into my lungs. The red surrounding me was more than color. I felt it course over me, heard it pounding beneath my skin, feeling as though I was part of that stream which pounded through the veins of a giant. I didn't even hear the third pop when another needle pierced my back. When I woke up, there was no longer any distinction between me and the blood pouring over my face. I tried to wipe my eyes, but the second my vision cleared, a fresh stream bubbled over them. I was disoriented, but I could vaguely sense that I was hanging upside down. My throat burned like I was being choked with a red-hot wire. I struggled to reach my feet which were tied above me, but my feeble lurch only served to send a fresh wave of blood from the gash in my neck to splatter in the bucket beneath me. I tried to scream, but all that came out was a wet splutter. I felt myself slipping out of consciousness again, but I held on and rubbed my eyes clear once more. There. Something was moving beside me, although the state of my overburdened senses and my reversed perspective made it almost impossible to distinguish the blurred shapes. You did all of this. For me. A voice. A woman's voice. I squinted and rubbed my eyes again. There were definitely two sets of legs beside me. I recognized one as Gregovich's stained overalls, but the other in a black dress was unfamiliar. It's my beacon, Gregovich said. I didn't want you to get lost. My vision slid away from me and I must have blacked out for a moment. Then my body lurched and I drifted through consciousness again. An old woman in a black dress was cradling me and easing me to the ground. Estyrich, she whispered. Don't worry. When your time has come, someone will call you back home too. Blackness returned, so deep and peaceful that I seemed to have slipped out of time and space altogether. My pain was gone. My thoughts were as diffused as smoke in the wind, although I did have a vague conception that I was looking for something. Then a bright light pricked my vacuous abyss and forced my attention to focus on the spot. Gradually it grew brighter, until with a blinding flash I felt a gasp of cold wind penetrate my lungs. I was lying on the red soil. My hands raced to my burning throat to feel a thick gauze wrapped around the jagged wound. It took me a full five minutes to stand, all the while unable to process any thought more rudimentary than an awareness of the light. Finally, agonizingly, I brought myself to my feet. The night was thick around me, 
and all the lights from Gregovich's house were out. Gradually my eyes regained their focus and the brilliant white light faded into the pale reflection of the roses around me. There was no sign of the blood upon their petals, and each blossom shone with the same incandescent splendor which pierced the darkness I was in. I managed to call an ambulance before slipping back into oblivion. I had suffered severe blood loss, and the doctor said that it was likely that my heart stopped beating for several minutes. If someone hadn't taken me down and bandaged my wound, there is no chance I would have survived. There has been no sign of Gregovich since the police swept his house, although his car remained parked in the garage. I even checked the grave where his wife was buried, but this too remained undisturbed. I tried to explain what happened, but the condescending explanation I received was that the bleeding and the tranquilizers caused me to hallucinate. That's what I would have thought too, if it wasn't for the field of snow-white roses outside of my window. I think that I really had been lost for a moment, until something had found me and called me home. Of all the worrisome mystery of this situation, there is one thing which most prominently denies my sleep at night. One of Gregovich's sons stayed at the house last weekend to pack up the old man's things. After the son had gone, I took another walk through the garden out of a morbid curiosity to try and shed some light on this horrendous business. All seventy-five white roses are as brilliant as ever, but the sun must have still made some alterations in the garden. Instead of the myriad of sacrificial animals once depicted on the signs, there is now only a single word blazoned across every board that stands as stoically as headstones. Human. Next story. I am a human voodoo doll. Have you ever fallen in love so bad that it hurts? Where you have to force yourself to not even think about the person, because otherwise your mind will run rampantly down a spiral of uncontrollable obsession. I can't taste food without remembering her laughing at my cooking which she affectionately named Bachelor Chow. Music is damp and muted without her singing along to the lyrics, and my morning alarm torments me with the prospect of another day where she isn't mine. Maybe I held on too tightly, maybe not tight enough. Maybe it wasn't something I did but something I am. It just seemed like the harder I tried, the further away Ellis drew, until one day she said she needed space. It was nauseating how polite and apologetic she was about it. She kept calling every other day to see if I was okay, and at first those gestures were my lifeline. I spent the whole day looking forward to the few minutes I would hear her voice again. I thought it was proof that she regretted her decision, and that it was only a matter of time. Before she came back to me. Now I know it was only pity. Apparently the space Ellis needed was already filled by someone else. I thought Nick the flabby-faced man-child was just a harmless friend. They were together almost immediately after she left me though, and the more I think about it, the more I wonder if it hadn't started even before. All those days when she just felt like doing her own thing. I guess that makes Nick her thing. You'd think that knowing she betrayed me would make it easier to stop loving her, but somehow it only made the obsession stronger. I can't move on with my life, and I'm running out of strength to keep pretending it will be okay. It's been two months since the breakup, and she still keeps trying to call and check in on me. I've stopped answering her. Text messages and voicemails are deleted before they're opened. I'm not writing this as an excuse or justification for what I was about to do. I was past the point of having to prove anything to anyone. And yeah, maybe it makes me a coward, but I didn't care about that either. I was done being treated like this, done feeling like this. I was just done. Amitriptyline is an antidepressant which failed to alter the world from shades of grey. Oxazepam is a sleeping pill which was inept against my thoughts of her. But half a bottle of each, and I wouldn't wake up again. It was supposed to be a very peaceful way to go. The taste was so bitter I could barely keep it down, but after that my mind just wiped clean. My last thoughts were that if I could do it all again, would have still gone down the same road. The time I shared with her was still worth the place where it must end. But it didn't end. I opened my eyes and squinted against the afternoon sun. 
I was lying in my bed, covers pulled up to my chin. Both the bottles of pills were gone. How did I wake up from that? I didn't even feel nauseous anymore. Was I supposed to just go find another method and try again? Or maybe this was God's way of giving me another chance. Did I even still care about her? I crawled over to my laptop and immediately checked Ellis's Facebook page. I could use her photos as a test. If I could look at them without being overwhelmed with pain then maybe she'd changed her profile picture. Flabby face was kissing her cheek. A feeling like acid worked its way down my chest. Nothing had changed. Nothing was ever going to change the way I felt, no. Something had changed. Her page was full of sympathetic prayers and comments. You were an angel. God must have needed you back. I'm so sorry to hear what happened. Let me know if there's anything I can do to help. I skimmed up to the top of the page. This was posted last night. This is Nick. I thought I should let you all know that Ellis died from a lethal dose of sleeping pills last night. I found her unconscious when. I visited this morning and rushed her to the hospital, but it was too. Late. Message me for details. I was completely dumbfounded. I had taken the pills, but somehow she had died instead. I had been thinking about her right before I went, so is there some way it had been transferred to her? It seemed impossible, but the coincidence of her going the same way on the same night seemed ludicrous. Besides, hadn't she been happy with Nick? My racing thoughts were shattered by a sudden fierce knocking on my door. Was it Ellis? Of course not, don't be stupid. I was about to open it when they knocked again. Police. We have a few questions to ask you. I froze, my hand still on the handle. It really was my fault she was dead. But how? I hadn't even seen her in weeks. Somehow what I did to myself happened to her, and the police being here proved it. Even if it was something else, my mind was too overwrought to begin to deal with them. I live on the ground floor, so it wasn't hard to just grab my keys and duck out my bedroom window. I didn't know where to go, but I just needed to drive around for a while and clear my head. I unlocked my car and was about to climb in when. Police. Stop right there. Two officers were emerging from my building. As soon as they caught sight of me, they began jogging. I should have just talked to them, but I felt compelled to run from the nameless clenching guilt and terror which possessed me. I jumped in the car and floored the pedal, tearing out of my apartment parking lot like I was running for my life. Last night I had been ready to die, but now I knew there was some greater power working through me. This was supposed to be my fresh start. I couldn't stop yet. The police car was right behind me. Sirens blared in accusation. My mind was at war with itself with panic. I could barely breathe. My familiar neighborhood looked alien to me. I screeched around the corner and up the overpass leading onto the freeway at breakneck speed. I was just becoming aware of the implications of my escape when a horrendous impact sent me spinning out of control. The police cruiser rammed me to prevent me getting on the freeway. The car spun two complete circles and smashed into a concrete barrier. The screech of metal was replaced with the roar of the airbags, and then everything went black. I hadn't been wearing my seatbelt, but that might have saved my life as I was thrown clear. I must have only been out for a few seconds though, because coming to I could still feel the warmth of my burning car behind me. The officers hadn't been so lucky. When they rammed my car, their car must have lost control in the opposite direction and fallen off the overpass. I didn't want to look, but I couldn't stop myself. The cruiser had flipped onto its roof, crushing the officers beneath it. But me? Somehow I didn't have a scratch. My crazy theory must not have been so far off. I take the pills, but I was thinking about Ellis and so she died instead. My car was hit, but I was thinking about the police and they suffered from the crash. Both times I walked away clean. 
I couldn't stay to ponder my discovery though, because I already heard more sirens approaching from the distance. I took off by foot and began running through the streets. I had to test my theory. Just one more time. If it was true, then some divine agent had resurrected me and I really did have something to live for. If it wasn't, then I was a suicidally depressed loner who was wanted by the police. I had nothing to lose and everything to gain, so it was time to put it all on the line. But with who? I couldn't just endanger an innocent stranger. I didn't want anyone else to get hurt except, well, except Nick of course. If it's anyone's fault Ellis died, it must have been his. It was his job to make her happy, wasn't it? His job to notice if something wasn't right. Hell, the scumbag went behind my back and stole her from me. If anyone deserved to suffer, it was him. I didn't want it to be clean either. Both other times I walked away unharmed, so I wanted him to suffer the way he made me suffer. I wanted to bring him to that point of hopeless isolation and rejection and leave him stranded beyond the hope of return. And more than anything, I wanted to be there to watch it happen. I found him at Ellis's apartment. Her old apartment, I guess, since she didn't live there anymore. I watched him carrying a box of her things to put into his car. She'd just died that morning, and he was already looting her stuff like a grave robber. There's no denying that I was going to enjoy watching him burn. Because I was going to burn with him. I continued watching him from behind the hedge which surrounded the parking lot. I watched his face while I poured gasoline over my head, imagining what it would look like after it lit up. Unspeakably grotesque. Either he would die, or the burns would disfigure him for life. He would be alone, just like I was after he stole her from me. It still wasn't good enough though. I wanted him to see me when it happened so he'd understand why. I waited by his car until he came back out with another box. The gasoline was cool against me, clinging comfortingly like a second skin. It burned like hell where it ran into my eyes, but I forced them to stay open. It was worth it to see the look on his face. Oh shit man, didn't see you there, he said. I guess you heard about Alice. I grinned. He still didn't know why I was here. I hadn't looked forward to anything so much since Alice left me. Can I help you with something, he asked. How come you're all wet? I twirled the lighter in my fingers. His eyes fell on it for the first time. Then he looked at my face, then back at the lighter. Then at the rainbow reflections in the pooling liquid around my feet. His eyes bulged, and I smiled wider. Now he gets it. This is for Ellis, I said. Flick. Flick. Whoosh. The fire started at my face and then swiftly engulfed my entire body. Nothing in my life prepared me for that pain. I stood there watching him for as long as I could, waiting for the spark to ignite in his skin. Waiting for the flesh to melt from his face and his bones to crack and splinter. Someone call the ambulance. Or the fire department. Or shit I don't know, get someone. I heard him shouting, but I couldn't see him anymore. My eyes must have boiled out of my skull. He said something else but I couldn't hear him over the sound of my own scream which tore out of my body like my soul seeking release. For the third time I blacked out, but I was still grinning the whole way. Soon I would wake up, and he would be the one who burned. Ellis had stopped by my apartment the night I took the pills. She was worried about me after I didn't reply to any of her calls or messages. Shit, she might have even still cared for me, but I guess I'll never know now. She must have been overwhelmed with guilt and grief at seeing me like that and taken the rest of the pills herself after she got back home. I was later informed of the pool of vomit in the corner of my bathroom where I had regurgitated my own lethal dose. The police hadn't died when their cruiser turned over. They'd just been pinned inside and unable to pursue me. They had only come by my apartment because their investigation had revealed Ellis visiting me on the night of her death. But Nick did burn. 
he had forced himself through the flame to get my burning clothes off and smother the fire with his body. If it wasn't for him, I never would have survived until the ambulance came. His face isn't scarred like mine, but he'll have the marks on his arms and chest for the rest of his life. He's a good man. Ellis would have been very happy with him if it wasn't for me. So I was wrong. I was too maddened by grief and self-loathing to understand until it was too late. There's no such thing as a human voodoo doll. There is no God working through me, or spirit of universal justice that makes everyone get what they deserve, but if my experience has one redeeming quality, then let it be a warning. No one should make life-altering decisions as a result of an emotional state. No matter how convinced your heart is that something is true, wait to act until your mind has caught up. If I had stopped for a moment to talk to Ellis, I would have seen how much she still cared, and I never would have done this to myself. If I hadn't run from the police, there never would have been this accident. And if I'd only thought my theory through, well one day we will all wake up as a different person than who we are now, and we will learn to forgive those who hurt us, and forgive ourselves for hurting others. Ellis is gone though, and the scars I'll have to remember her by will never heal.